Well, as always, the very first thing that we do before we dive into God's holy word is we pray. And we ask for his Holy Spirit to take complete and total control. I am fully aware, as I posted to Facebook earlier this afternoon, as I was working on this message, uh, God just kept giving me uh, more things to add to it, and uh, I, I posted on Facebook earlier, I covet your prayers. We're coming up against the powers of darkness when we enter this territory, but we're coming up against those powers in the name of Jesus, and we're fighting a battle that is not a battle of the flesh, and it is a battle that we win through the name of Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray. And whether you know a lot about the Bible or you know very little, whether you've ever seen any of these sessions, because we're in uh, part five now of the Tower of Babel and Godless Globalism, it doesn't matter. They're not cumulative in the sense that you can't gain from it. Whatever your situation is, whatever your knowledge of the word, I believe that God is going to touch you. And you are going to learn something amazing tonight by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior. We thank you, Jesus, that you shed your blood on the cross to forgive our sins, to set us on the path of righteousness, and to purchase for us salvation that will culminate with a brand new body, a brand new heaven, and a brand new earth. Thank you, dear Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit, who is with us right now as we study. We praise you, Holy Spirit, and we ask you to be especially present, to make yourself known. I pray that you would show me every point that you would like emphasized tonight. And that you highlight for each and every person whatever it is you know that they need to hear by way of conviction or by way of comfort. My prayer, Lord God, is that Jesus would become bigger and bigger and bigger in people's lives. Because as we're soon going to learn, Jesus is going to become everything in the universe very soon. But Lord, may the power of your word go forth. I pray that a cheapened gospel uh, would, would dissipate as we learn that your word is truth and that you work miracles through the proclamation of your word. Help us to believe in you, not just with our minds, but with our hearts, with our very lives, and to live with the hope that you have called us to. Thank you, Lord God. I pray that you come against every power of darkness, every demonic power that would seek to uh, distract us, dissuade us, divide us. Help us, Lord, to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. We left off at Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. For those of you who haven't been tuned in with us, it only took us four Bible study sessions to get through two verses, okay? Four sessions to get through two verses, and now we're on the third verse. And here we go. They said to one another, now these are the people at the Tower of Babel, okay? The whole world had come together. As a matter of fact, maybe I'll just read, let me read verses one and two for you, in case you weren't with us last evening, for continuity's sake, or last time that we met. So this is Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, and again, we're trying to break that myth that the Tower of Babel is just some fairy tale story that has some moral value to it. No, the Tower of Babel is a literal historical event. And God has recorded for us these words. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Now, we left off at this point last week, and I do want to review just a couple of things for continuity to carry this thing through to another level that we didn't get to the last time we met. So I want you to focus on the fact that when humanity came together with one language and it, with a rebellious spirit towards the Lord, they said to one another, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. 
We want these bricks to be strong because as we learned last week, there, there wasn't really access to stone in that Mesopotamian valley where they were. And so they were determined to do what they wanted to do with or without the stone. And as you're going to see, stone represents God. Jesus is the rock. And when people are determined to do whatever they want to do with or without Jesus, that's going to lead you to trouble every time. Okay? Uh, they said, let us burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. So instead of stone, they used brick, ironically, at the Tower of Babel. We learned last week, and I'm not going to take you there again, but in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8, which we read, we find that God always builds with stone. And that Jesus is, in fact, the stone that the builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. So when God uses this analogy, he always likens Christ to the rock, to the stone. But then what we found last week is in the prophetic book of Daniel, okay? And again, we're, we're tying Babel, the Tower of Babel, together with the coming Antichrist Babylon. Babel is synonymous with Babylon, which we know strings throughout the Old Testament right on into the coming Antichrist world system. And so the Tower of Babel actually has a lot to do with prophecy. So we went to Daniel chapter 2 last week, do you remember? And we read this entire text, which I encourage you to do again. And we looked at the dream that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream of a statue, which actually is an incredible prophecy that Daniel interpreted for King Nebuchadnezzar. It's a prophecy of which we've seen much of it fulfilled, and therefore we know that the rest of it will be fulfilled. Now let me bring you to a visual, a picture of that statue that we reviewed last week. God gave this dream to Nebuchadnezzar to show him that the head of gold on this mighty statue represented the Babylonian Empire, which was the empire that Nebuchadnezzar ruled over. The Babylonian Empire was the empire that took God's people captive. All right? Then, as Daniel interpreted that for King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, look, the, the middle part here is the, the silver part represents the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire, which, of course, if you know historically, any of you who studied world history, the Babylonians truly did exist, and they truly did fall to the Persians, okay? So this has been fulfilled in real history. And then the third section here is the bronze part of the statue, Daniel showed Nebuchadnezzar that God was saying that would be the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great in Greece took over the world after the Persians. And then this statue had two long legs that were of iron, which most Bible scholars would say is synonymous with the former Roman Empire. Okay, the strong and mighty Roman Empire that was the, uh, responsible, the government there, along with the Jews, for crucifying Jesus. And then finally, this strange statue had a, a, a feet and toes that were made of iron and clay mixed together. Do you remember reading that? We only, we only touched on this last week. And then finally, in the vision or the dream, God shows that a rock comes that was made by no human hand, and, and finally rolls into that statue and obliterates it so that that statue becomes like chaff blowing in the wind. And what we reviewed last week was what God showed Daniel in the interpretation of this dream is these are four kingdoms of the world. Now, remember, in Danny and Nebuchadnezzar's time, the only kingdom that was then in existence was the Babylonian Empire. So, stay with me on this. So, Danny and Nebuchadnezzar, so far as they knew, they were only living in this part of the statue. And Danny was trusting God that what God was saying about these coming three, four kingdoms, actually, and then a fifth kingdom, as you count the kingdom of God, Danny was trusting that what God had told him was true. But we now, living in 2020, 
we look back at this dream and this statue and we can see, hallelujah, that God's word is sure. I want you to grapple with this. I want you to understand this. This was literally fulfilled in the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. These four parts of this statue have literally been fulfilled. And we have the advantage of looking back and seeing that, which is something Danny didn't even have, but by faith he believed what God was telling him. But you and I are living somewhere in the space between these legs and these toes, these ten toes of iron and clay. And we're waiting to see this fulfilled, and we're waiting to see this fulfilled. I want to focus for just a time on those toes, on those feet that were a mix of iron and clay, because God is very specific about that. Now, of course, he does tell us that the kingdom of God, the rock Jesus Christ, will eventually roll into this whole thing. And, and obliterate all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus will be the singular king of kings and lord of lords. Hallelujah. We will see that happen. Praise God. But I want to focus on the iron and clay toes and feet. So we're going to dig in to a few verses here in Daniel chapter 2. And this is very important. You may say, why are we doing this? Because it relates to the prophecies of the coming Antichrist, the coming new Babylonian Empire, and what we see happening in our world today. Prophecy is being fulfilled in front of our eyes. So let's, let's review this. So in Daniel chapter 2, not rereading all the verses about the statue, but focusing on those feet, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, by God's Holy Spirit, he said, and as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. What kingdom? That mysterious fifth kingdom. Remember, you had the Babylons, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Roman Empire. And there is a kingdom to come yet. And that is what is spoken of here. And it will be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. Now remember, the historical Roman Empire that existed when Jesus walked the earth was represented as pure iron. But this coming fifth kingdom will be a mixture of iron with clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. All right? So what we know is this coming kingdom, unlike the former Roman Empire, will be like a new revived Roman Empire, partly of iron, but partly of clay. And it will be divided. It won't hold together properly. Verse 43, as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. Who? These kingdoms, the kings, the leaders of these kingdoms, all right? They, they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And so God, in giving a very specific prophecy most of which we have already seen fulfilled, puts himself out on the line here and gives us some details of this coming kingdom while holding it just a bit mysterious, all right? Verse 44, and in the days of those kings, see, that's a reference to the kings of these, uh, these kingdoms that are about to come. He said, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. In the days of what kings? The kings that don't hold together, that don't mix properly. That represents, as I'm going to show you, uh, the world under Antichrist. So in the days of Antichrist, during the days of the tribulation, all of a sudden, Jesus is going to roll in. Okay? I believe the rapture happens before the tribulation, but it's at the end of the tribulation that Jesus literally appears and sets up his kingdom. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms 
and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Hallelujah. I shared with you last week, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Revelation eleven fifteen. It says that one day in the future, we will stand and say, the kingdom of this world, this broken, disgusting, uh, tense, uh, diseased, fighting world, the kingdom of this world will become, it has become, it, uh, Revelation speaks of it past tense, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And that will happen at the end of Antichrist's empire. Now, I want to go back to verse 43, and I want to focus on a verse of scripture that seems quite a bit mysterious and that Bible scholars have really tried to figure out for a long time. Uh, there are divided opinions on it, but I want to share with you my opinion of it based on the scripture. So Daniel 2.43 says, As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. So in this new revived Roman Empire, in this empire of the coming Antichrist, first of all, there will be toes. And we know that there are ten toes, the Bible says, just as the average person has ten toes. So there are going to be ten kings involved in this, all right? And the Bible says that they are going to try to mix. Now, the English Standard Version says they're going to try to mix with one another in marriage. But I have a little one there because there's a footnote in the English Standard Version that tells you that in the Aramaic, and by the way, Daniel uh, just about chapters 2 through 7, I believe it is, of the book of Daniel, actually was originally written in Aramaic. And so the footnote tells you that in Aramaic, that could be translated, instead of in marriage, it could be translated by the seed of men. Interesting. Okay? And translators aren't 100% sure what to do with that. Different translations of the Bible will say different things, as I'm going to show you in a minute. ESV chooses to say in marriage, but puts a footnote that we could literally read it as by the seed of men. They will try to mix with one another by the seed of men, but they will not hold together. Now, if you look at that in the King James Version of the Bible, it's rendered this way. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So in the King James Version, which was translated for us uh, and released in 1611, one another in the seed of men. But they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. And so we see here that God is clearly trying to tell us that the days of these kings, there will be an attempt to mix these kings or these kingdoms together, but they're not going to hold. Now, is it done by marriage? What does this mean specifically by the seed of men? I want to talk to you about that for a minute. But before I go to the incredible thing that I'm about to share with you, I want to take you to a few other scriptures because we should always allow scripture to interpret scripture along with, you know, uh, people who are anointed by God and dedicated a proven track record of accurately commenting on the scriptures and studying the scriptures. But our first line of defense is to always allow scripture to interpret scripture. So I want to take you to uh, the little book of Jude. It only has one chapter. And I want to point out a verse, I think it's two verses there, in the tiny book of Jude. All right? The Bible says in Jude, verse 6, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, God has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now I want you to try to digest that for a minute. What the Bible is saying here is, that there were a certain subset of angels who did not stay within their own position of authority. That they left their proper dwelling place. And as we're going to see, this is a reference to fallen angels. Okay? 
and that God is keeping them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness. So there's a certain subset of fallen angels who did something. They left their proper position. They left the place where they were really supposed to dwell. And now this subset of fallen angels exists in a particular place. Now, we know that many fallen angels are not chained in gloomy darkness. I think of the demons that possessed uh, the man who was possessed by a legion of, of, of demons in the Gospels we read of him. There was actually two of them, but Matthew, I think, focuses on one of them. But nonetheless, the demons, when Jesus was casting them out of the man, begged not to go to the abyss. They begged not to be chained and to be stopped, and, and Jesus let them go into a herd of pigs. We know that there are many, many, many fallen angels who are free to roam the earth as we know Satan, their leader, does. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We know that he has access both to the throne of God to try to accuse us, and he obviously is roaming this world, seeking whom he may devour, all right? So there's a certain subset, though, of those angels who don't seem to have that freedom because they did something very specific. They left their proper dwelling. Now, Jude goes on in the next verse to say this, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now watch that again, because the context or the connection of these particular fallen angels that are now chained in gloomy darkness, the context and the connection is God says, just as, or in accordance with what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah, which, look at this, likewise engaged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. So you know that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed for its godlessness, and one of its major sins was the sin of homosexuality, which is unnatural desire, sexual immorality. Interesting that sexual immorality or unnatural desire of a different kind is connected to these fallen angels. All right, so digest that for a minute as we read that reality. And I'm going to take you to another scripture. I'm going to take you to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, and by the way, the word for hell here in the Greek, this is the only, uh, the Greek word for hell here, this is the only time it's used for hell, is in this particular scripture. So we think that this is a very uh, especially uh, deep and dark place where these angels are particularly held, kind of cooperating what Jude said. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and I put dot, 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 because it goes on, and you can read that in its full context. But what I want you to see is, again, we have a reiteration here of certain angels that committed a particular sin and got cast into hell, into chains of gloomy darkness, where they are kept. And they don't seem to be roaming freely like other fallen angels and demons are. And then God connects it to the days of Noah. The unnatural desire he connects to Sodom and Gomorrah, but then he connects these angels again to the days of Noah. Keep that in mind. All right, I want you to keep that in mind. Now, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. And I realize that for those of you who've been studying Genesis with me, for some time, back when we used to uh, meet together in person, you may remember some of this, but I'm frequently told, my technical department tells me all the time, I could hear, Shelley, you teach something in a different way, in a different context. You know, the more times that I hear you teach it, the more it solidifies. So I'm sure that those of you who have, we studied this, will not mind the review. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 6, which is pre-flood, right before the flood. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. When man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive 
and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, the giants that can be rendered, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Then the Bible says the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so the Lord regretted that he made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I'm going to blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I'm sorry that I have made them, but Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. So again, this is a strange passage of scripture that is much debated where the Bible says very specifically it calls this particular group the sons of God coming down to the daughters of men and they took them and had sexual relationship with them. And right after that, we hear God say, my Holy Spirit is not going to abide with you forever. My Holy Spirit is not going to put up with them, this. And the Bible then says this strange race of beings, the Nephilim, the giants, were on the earth when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and bore children to them. And then we read that wickedness, the man's thoughts were only evil continually, and God said, I'm going to have to do something major here. I'm going to have to do some major destruction to prohibit uh, the complete blow-up of the earth because God's plan his, his savior hadn't even come yet. And God had to intervene in a major way in the flood. So I'm not going to take time to go very deeply into this. I did take time to look that I believe it was right around the middle of January, January 15th, January 8th, uh, that you could go back and access our Genesis Bible study on this. Uh, I think it was called the mystery of the Nephilim. I taught for a couple weeks on it, so you can go into greater detail with that. But what I want to propose to you is, there's a question is, who were the sons of God and who were the daughters of men? Why was it phrased this way? Why did the Nephilim end up on the earth after that? Why uh, did that happen right before God decided he had to destroy everyone? And I'm going to refer to uh, John Phillips, wonderful Bible commentator. Uh, I agree with so much of what he says, very deep. Here's what he said. Genesis 6, 1 to 2, when it talks about the sons of God which in, in other parts of the Bible, sons of God is, ref, is, is a reference to angels, okay? He says, Genesis 6, 1 to 2 refers to a second and deeper apostasy in the ranks of the angels. A host of angels had already followed Lucifer in the initial rebellion against God. Now some of those fallen angels fell even lower. So John Phillips is at the persuasion that sons of God, there is a reference to fallen angels, and that they came to the earth and found the daughters of men and decided to have sexual relation with them, producing this strange race of people and producing a situation where evil was so rampant that God's option was, I'm going to destroy the entire world by a flood, save this tiny remnant. Okay? Keep that in mind. And, and for some of you, you've never heard this before, so your head is really spinning. But when I tie it to what's going on in the world today, your head might stop spinning. And you might say... You might go from a spinning head to like a, wow, maybe so. All right? So that's what he, now, let me back up. You know, when Lucifer fell and rebelled against God, which obviously happened before man and woman were created, sometime before that, because Lucifer was around as a fallen angel then, when Lucifer originally fell, we believe he took a third of the angels with him and they fell with him. What John Phillips is saying is, out of those fallen angels... There seems to be a second apostasy, a deeper apostasy, that a subset of those fallen angels decided to do something even worse, which is what I believe Jude and 2 Peter were referencing. Defying the limits set by God, these fallen angels went after strange flesh, as it's rendered in Jude 7. According to both Jude and 2 Peter, some fallen angels are no longer free to roam the air but are incarcerated in Tartarus, okay, that is the word that is rendered hell in, the, in, that, in that passage, a place of imprisonment more terrible than Hades, which is the place of torment of the dead. See, as a special 
compartment of hell, it almost seems. There they are reserved in chains awaiting their final judgment. Because of their lust, impurity, and outrage, God has locked them up. And I'm not just pulling this out of my head. We see other scriptures corroborating this. Okay? Now, John Phillips went on to say, that is not so of the many of the fallen angels who as principalities and powers, and that's a reference to Ephesians 6, 12. The Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He is referring to Ephesians 6.12, that there are hierarchies of fallen angels or demons that we are battling. They hold the world in subjection under Satan, their Lord. So there are many fallen angels that are roaming the earth right now working for Satan, and we do battle with them all the time. But those doubly fallen angels defy the law of their being, not merely by deceiving and consorting with members of the human race, but by the actual marriage act itself. Jude and Peter both put the sin of those fallen ones alongside the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin of going after strange flesh. Okay, so unnatural affection. In this case, would be the unnatural affection or wanting of angels to have some type of sexual relationship with humans. Wow, the evil inbreeding. And I'm here to tell you, you know, everything that God is and does, Satan tries to pervert and mimic and imitate. God came in the flesh, and I believe here you have Satan trying to dig so deeply into humanity. Now, Francis Schaeffer, that well-trusted apologist, the late Francis Schaeffer, said this. Speaking of this theory that the sons of God were fallen angels. He says, there's further interest along this line if one understands this as a commingling of the angelic and the human. For then it is possible that it was the original historic source of an element that's common in mythology. More and more we're finding that mythology in general, though greatly contorted, very often has some historic base. I've said this to you over and over. Any lie that we hear historically, can be traced back to an original truth of God. So if it continues to show up in the mythology of nations, that supernatural beings attempt to have sex with natural beings, then maybe that is a reflection of a real truth somewhere down the line. So he says... The interesting thing is that one myth that one finds over and over again in many parts of the world is that somewhere a long time ago, supernatural beings had sexual intercourse with natural women and produced a special breed of people. So if that myth is common, can it be traced back to an actual truth? It's just like, you know, you have different renditions of, of uh, Noah's flood, mythologically different renditions of that, and they are not God's truth, but they're a perversion or they can be traced back to a truth of God. Albert Barnes, I'm going to appeal to one more commentator before I bring this kind of to a head and talk about it, what's going on in our day. Albert Barnes, who does not have the same uh, outlook that I do and that many Bible scholars have as the attentos being somewhere in the future, he would attribute that back to the old Roman Empire. But still, he has something very interesting to say about this scripture in Daniel about the intermingling. Uh, here's what he says. The expression seed of men as here used. Now, again, this is back in Daniel when it says that they will try to intermingle or intermarry with the seed of men, okay? Would therefore denote some intermingling of an inferior race with the original stock some union or alliance under the one sovereignty, which would greatly weaken it as a whole, though the original strength still was great. In other words, he was looking at it saying, you know what, the Roman Empire and all of its strength and its kings and its leaders, they're going to try to intermingle and intermarry with the weaker people. And it's going to cause damage. The language would represent a race of mighty and powerful men constituting the stamina the bone and the sinew of the empire, mixed up with another race or races, with whom? 
though they were associated in government, they could never be blended. They could never really assimilate. This foreign admixture in the empire would be a constant source of weakness and would constantly tend to division and faction, for such elements could never harmonize. So Albert Barnes is saying whatever is intermingling, whatever is mixing here can't really be together. And they're doing it for one purpose, but it is prohibiting the ultimate power that is needed. Now I have a question for you. When I taught this before, back when we were studying Genesis chapter 6, the question becomes, what about angel-human sexual unions? Can that really happen? You know, were these sons of God, did these fallen angels literally come down, take on bodies, and have sex with these women? Is it possible? And what would be the theological answer to how their progeny, how their children then, would answer to God? If they're a mix of the angelic and the human. So I want to share with you the conclusion that I came to. First of all, in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30, uh, a lot of people appeal to this scripture. It tells us something about angels and marriage. You're probably familiar with it. In Matthew 22, verse 30, Jesus answered the Sadducees, and he said in the resurrection, when we get our brand new bodies, people will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, I would have to preach a whole sermon on that for you to understand what that means. But, you know, people say, oh, no, we won't be married in heaven. But the, the issue is not that you won't know the person that you were married to in heaven. The issue is that everyone, hallelujah, in the perfect kingdom of God will be completely united. Because the true marriage, marriage on earth is only meant to be a, a, a faint foreshadowing of the true consummation. The true marriage of Christ to the church, amen? So we will be in that most desirable condition of consummating our relationship with Jesus Christ where everyone will be perfected and we will all be related perfectly. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a lack that anyone will suffer. But Jesus says here, uh, there will not be marriage in heaven. They will not marry or give in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And so the Bible seems to indicate that angels do not get married. Angels do not have sexual relationship. But the thing you got to remember about that verse is these are the angels in heaven. Okay, so these are the angels that haven't fallen that Jesus is speaking of. These are the angels that are still serving God. Number two, uh, my question is, could fallen angels materialize in bodily form and actually cohabitate with people and we don't have time to go into it, but please write these down. Go to Genesis 18, 1 to 8. And these are actually Old Testament examples. So we're talking about Noah's flood, you know, which is a realistic uh, time frame there. Genesis 18 and Genesis 19, where we see angels come in the form of men and visit Abraham and visit Lot. Okay? Very human looking. All right? So... Can, could fallen angels materialize in bodily form and cohabitate? Well, we know that God allows angels to do so. The question is, would he allow fallen angels to do so? And while the Bible doesn't give us an explicit answer, I, can th I think you can see the direction this is going. Now, I want to submit to you another possibility, whether we're talking about directly angels having sexual relationship with women, producing the Nephilim or not. I want to propose to you this possibility that Dr. Henry Morris gives. And uh, by the way, this is the one that I endorse. I'm in complete agreement with on him. A solution seems to consist in recognizing that the children were true human children of truly human fathers and mothers but that all were possessed and controlled by evil spirits. That is, these fallen angelic sons of God accomplished their purposes by something equivalent to demon possession. In dwelling the bodies of human men and then also taking or possessing the bodies of the women as well. Because the scripture is very clear that these sons of men came down and they wanted the women and they took them to be their wives. They possessed them to be their wives. And so what Henry Morris is intimating here is that this wasn't necessarily a fallen angel putting on flesh having sex with women. 
But it was more like there was such a demonic influence and such a demonic possession over people then, some of these men back then, that that possession was then passed on in this sexual relationship to these women. And the conglomeration of the evil was just unheard of to the point where a strange race of people came about to the point where God said, I have to bring sure judgment. I've got to destroy everybody except for Noah and his family. Just ponder that for a minute. And as you're thinking of it, I've written in my notes, most incredible to me is the tie to end times. I believe wholeheartedly that there was something profoundly demonic going on and that that was more than just humans and humans. But that as we're going to see at the Tower of Babel, as I've begun to show you, at the Tower of Babel, humanity was not building a tower so that they could reach the real God. They were building a tower so that they could access portals to call down the false gods, Lucifer's fallen angels. And that through a grand perversion and rebellion, they opened up portals of demonic influence, which still exist today. Horoscopes, astrology, tarot card reading, crystal ball, mediums, all of these things, my friends, are satanic. And you are opening up portals. You're opening up your life, your family's life, lives to demonic influence. Happens in all kinds of ways. But I want to show you the tie that this has to end times. Turn with me to that famous chapter, Matthew 24, where Jesus speaks of the coming tribulation. We've gone there many times. Matthew 24 and verse 37. I'll start at 36. Jesus said, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I believe one reason Jesus said that is because of how the flood caught everybody off guard. But Jesus is strong. He's making a strong connection there between his return and the days of Noah. All right? And look at what he says in verse 38. As in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the flood came and swept them all away. Interesting, too. I never thought of this, but in verse 36, Jesus says, No one knows, not even the angels of heaven as were the days of Noah, okay? So Jesus compares Noah's time to the time of his return, and then look at Luke 21, verse 11. Luke 21, verse 11. In a parallel scripture here, Jesus says, I'll pick it up at verse 10, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Terrors and great signs from heaven. Certainly, if the sons of God were fallen angels in Genesis, coming down to mix with humanity, that is a terror from the heavenly realms. Wow. So I just want you to, to ponder those verses, to think about that. I appeal to Henry Morris again. Now, he wrote this in 1976. So it's some years back, but it's just as relevant, more relevant today. Here's what he said. A closely related phenomenon is the tremendous recent upsurge of interest in the host of heaven in terms of astrology the so-called chariots of the gods, the various unidentified flying objects and their strange occupants. Although scientists quite properly have pointed out the fallacious assumptions and interpretations involved with UFOs, there remains a stubborn residuum of scientifically inexplicable yet apparently well-verified phenomena attached to these highly unusual types of data. People today are still as drawn to relying on the created stars rather than the creator of the stars as they ever were. 
And I believe that leads to demons coming in. And I 100% agree with Henry Morris. As a matter of fact, I said it a long time ago when we were studying the book of Revelation some years ago. I said, there is such a preoccupation with alien life forms right now, time travelers, alien life forms. And I believe one of the reasons is those things are satanically driven. And I believe when the rapture happens and people can't explain where everyone's gone, one of the things that will be said was the aliens took them. And I say that kind of fun, uh, in fun, but not really. I believe that Henry Morris is 100% correct. You know, there are people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, interfacing with aliens, people claim to have seen UFOs, and some of it can be discredited, but some of it is quite mysterious, and people seem to really believe they've had an experience. I, I sat across the table from a woman who was fully convinced she had been abducted by aliens and was still being haunted by them. Do I think that what she said is true? Yes, I actually acknowledge as such. I said, yes, I believe something has happened to you. But my friend, it's not aliens. It is the, the, the fallen, head fallen angel Lucifer who masquerades as an angel of light and would be very happy to masquerade as an alien because you don't think of aliens as evil necessarily. It's one of Satan's disguises. And when we get all caught up in these things, Satan loves that because he can work through those portals. Henry Morris went on to say, it should not be forgotten that there do exist principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12 again, and that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2, 2. Evil angels, as well as God's unfallen holy angels, apparently on certain occasions have the ability both to appear in material forms of various sorts, even as ministers of righteousness, and also to inhabit and control the bodies of human beings. This book is replete with demon possessions, with humans who end up doing uh, crazy things because of demon possession. The Apostle Paul was abundantly clear in 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. He tells us, that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, and for that reason, many of the preachers of the gospel who look like apostles are actually demonically driven and possessed. Do you hear that? And Satan is not going to walk into your church with a pitchfork and horns on his head, with fangs coming out. Satan's not going to walk into your life that way. He's going to come waltzing into your church as a preacher of the gospel with a Bible in hand, all ready to pervert and twist scriptures, to omit, to not speak of what he doesn't want speak it, spoken of, to, to emphasize the wrong things and de-emphasize the wrong things. That is what Satan does. He masquerades as an angel of light. And you are a fool to think that the same Bible that declares that Satan actually walks into churches as a human being possessed of his power. You're a fool to think that he is not fooling around with the unsaved and in the world. I hope you're with me. I hope you understand. He's got his hand in the church. He's got his hand in politics. He's got his hand in your family. If you're fooling around with any of these things that are not of God. Am I screaming too loud? I thought the technical partner was going to go turn down the sound system. Are you guys still with me? I still have about six or seven minutes. I'm going to go a little bit over if you don't mind. I mean, you stop me at 10 o'clock tonight. That'll be good enough. But well, I'm just kidding, okay? <laughs> but I want, I want to roll with this till I get to a certain place. So Henry Morris went on to say, Furthermore, Jesus warned that in the last days, fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Luke 21, 11, that we just went to. It may be that this particular feature of the days of Noah is beginning to be repeated in the modern proliferation of this great complex of unexplained and spiritually intimidating occult phenomena. The purpose of which seems to be to gain direct satanic control over the minds and bodies of hosts of human beings before Christ returns. I 100% agree with that. 
I had a dear sister in Christ message me just the other day and tell me that her daughter would like for me to do some TikToks for the young people about astrology and horoscopes because apparently there's an uptick and there's a resurgence of trying to bring the horoscope and astrology to the lives of young people. Just a week or two ago, I showed you that I was watching Good Morning America and saw two psychics, uh, uh, two, two women who read horoscopes just published a book to help parents guide their children by the horoscopes, by the stars. And I'm telling you, this is real. Satan is working overtime right now. I believe he was working overtime before the flood. This is why it caused God to do what he did. I believe that he is working overtime now. All right? He was working overtime at the flood, overtime at the Tower of Babel, and overtime now. I'm going to show you that with a graphic that I've come up with. Paul McGuire and Troy Anderson. They wrote a wonderful book called The Babylon Code. I recommend you read it. Here's what they said. In the New Testament, Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. A growing number of prophecy scholars argue that Jesus was telling us that in the last days, the Nephilim would return. Today, it's interesting to note that the science of transhumanism is exploding all around us. Global experimentation with the interspecies breeding of human and animal DNA is also on the rise. I encourage you to go back to my teachings on the Nephilim from January, I believe it was. Uh, look for the mystery of the Nephilim. Uh, contact us. The technical department will get you that info. I want to tell you something. Artificial intelligence. All kinds of transhumanistic stuff is going on. They're already playing around with mixing the DNA of people and animals. Are already trying to create bionic people. Implant so many things. Upload brains into a computer. I mean, it's unbelievable. I don't have time to go into that all right now. But what they're saying is true. The international transhumanism movement has existed for decades. But has grown in popularity in recent years as evidenced by blockbuster Hollywood films such as Lucy, Her, and Transcendence, starring Johnny Depp. Despite its growing popularity, many people around the world still don't know what transhuman means. Zoltan Istvan, a futurist and journalist, wrote in a recent article for the Huffington Post titled, A New Generation of Transhumanists is Emerging. Transhuman literally means beyond human. Transhumanists consist of life extensionist, techno-optimist, singularitarian, singularitarians, biohackers, roboticists, artificial intelligent proponents, and futurists who embrace radical science and technology to improve the human condition. These are people who are desperately trying to defy disease and death. Without Jesus, look at me now, there is no way to defy death without Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen out there? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 But people who are into this transhumanism think that we can somehow live forever or extend our lives or overcome our shortcomings without God in our own humanistic way. And they are fooling themselves because when we delve into these areas, you will either worship God or Satan. You can call yourself an atheist, you can call yourself a humanist, and you can think it's just you in the world, but it is not. If God is not your father, Satan is your father. Satan is influencing all of these things. Satan is behind it. Wake up, Church of Jesus Christ. Start preaching it, pastors. Start teaching it, Sunday school teachers. Stop ignoring it. Amen. All right. So I came up with a graphic. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. I want this to hit home. I designed this just this afternoon. It wasn't even a part of this study to begin with. You have the creation of the world by God. 
the way he intended things to be. Creation of the world by God. And throughout history, until the day in which we live right now in 2020, we have increasing wickedness and demonic influence. Just always going up and up and up. As is shown by the flood. Okay? Wickedness and demonic influence was increasing. And as I showed you in Genesis chapter 6, I believe that man had become so rebellious, so self-sufficient, so ignorant of God in a, in a purposeful way that demonic influence came down. I do believe and that, that fallen angels possessed men, that these strange demonic possessions were happening, this intermixing, and that is why God had to do such a drastic thing as the flood, flooding the world at that time. Okay? A reset. Okay, a reset, a restart. He gave it a restart with Noah and his family. But of course, you know what happens? Noah gets off the ark and gets drunk, right? And his sons, you know, uh, Ham looks at him and takes advantage of the situation and, and just goes, goes downhill from there, or I should say uphill in increasing wickedness. Until we come to the Tower of Babel, which is what we're studying now. And at the Tower of Babel, you are going to see that what God has to do as the world comes together, uniting to draw down on powers of darkness to worship the created thing rather than the creator, there is another grand demonic influence that happens to the point where God has to do something drastic again and he disperses humanity and confuses all languages. That's pretty drastic. Because the wickedness increases. So you could see God being patient and dealing with it till it culminates. It, it continues to grow. He's patient. He deals with it. Then it culminates. He interacts. My friends, listen to me. The next measure will be as increasing wickedness and demonic influence is crescendoing in the world today. We don't know exactly when, but it's crescendoing will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. There will be demonic influence and wickedness as we have never seen. We can see it on the uptick. We see it rising. And God will once again intervene. But this time when he intervenes, he won't leave us to ourselves anymore. It will be Jesus Christ the rock who wrecks into the kingdoms of the world and blows them away like chaff and sets up his eternal kingdom. So you see the increasing wickedness and demonic influence and the times that God has intervened, I believe, are clear from the Bible. But at this point, when he comes again, my friends... It will be the recreation. Amen? Am I getting a hallelujah out there? It will be the recreation of the world. And watch this. You'll see the same, the same shape. But this time, the book of Isaiah tells us that of the government and peace of Jesus, there shall be no end. Watch this. Instead of increasing wickedness and demonic influence at the recreation, it will be increasing government of Jesus and peace. If you're sick of politics today, if you're sick of broken promises, if you know that no human being can ever fix this world, this is exciting. Because the Bible says not only will Jesus govern, not only will there be his peace on all the earth, but it will continue to increase into infinity without end. This just keeps going up and up and getting better and better. So again, in the world today, we see increasing wickedness and demonic influence. But you hold on because the next time God intervenes, won't be like the flood, won't be like the Tower of Babel. There won't be a second chance. He won't let it proliferate again. He's going to wipe it out, recreate until his government and his peace is forever. Hallelujah. Excited by that? Hey, I know it's, it, it's not even Thanksgiving yet, but Christmas is just around the corner. And we put this verse on so many of our Christmas cards and we don't even realize what we're saying. It comes from Isaiah chapter 9. Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. 
Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay? That's exciting. But I want you to focus once again on what I've said to you here. As I see it, the pattern of the Bible is clear. At each one of these intervening points, there was a culmination of demonic influence and wickedness just culminated to the point where God said, I will intervene. And I believe that the Bible is clear that that will once again happen, as were the days of Noah. And clearly the Bible intimates that the Tower of Babel is a type and foreshadowing of the Antichrist kingdom. Now, I'm going to, I just want to go ahead here and see, yes. Tell me, technical department, if I get a thumbs up on this. Can I take five more minutes of your time? Because we're not meeting for two weeks again, okay? Can I take five more minutes? If I get at least two or three thumbs up, I'll say yes. If I don't, you'll just see me close my mouth and walk off. Right? Okay, okay. I'm getting four or five. Okay, there we go. All right, so here we go. As you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. All right? The demonic influence, the human influence, back in the days of Noah, it didn't hold, it didn't work. All right, God had to intervene, and he had to flood the world and destroy that. In the coming days of the Antichrist, these kingdoms will not be able to adhere. Anything that is in rebellion against God will never last. It's not going to work. I want to tell you today, give you something to chew on before we meet again on November 3rd. Maybe you can do some research. You can look into this yourself. The European Union is a foreshadowing or precursor to the Ten Nation Confederacy of Antichrist. When you read your Bible and you look at that statue and its interpretation in Daniel chapter 2. And you see the kingdoms that have come and gone. And then you come to the feet and toes of iron and clay. Know this. The ten toes of that statue represents the ten nation confederacy that is reiterated in Daniel chapter 7 and in the book of Revelation. It's abundantly clear that Antichrist will first head a ten-nation confederacy. The European Union is not that, but it is definitely a precursor, a setup, and a foreshadowing of that. Okay? Let me show you some things about the European Union. In 1951, six nations formed the European Coal and Steel Community. That was the embryo of the European Union back in 1951. And you may notice that 1951 is three years after the establishment of Israel as a state. Okay, when Israel finally got its homeland, it only took the devil three years to start working towards a type or foreshadowing of the Antichrist system. Okay, ironic. The euro, which is a single currency, was established in 2002. The euro as a single currency between nations. In 2009, the president of Europe position was established. And again, I don't believe the president of Europe is the Antichrist, but I believe that that is a foreshadowing. It's in its beginning stages. The stage is being set for nations to come together under one man. The European Union has 27 countries included now. Now remember, it started with six. There are 27 countries that are included in the European Union at this point. 19 of those countries are all using the same currency. My friends, it won't take much. It won't take much for Antichrist to have one form of currency over the world. Right? It's all coming together under globalism. 24 official languages are represented in the European Union. 24 languages are spoken by those nations. And their motto is united in diversity. Okay? Iron and clay will attempt to mix, but they won't be able to hold. 
You can't take ten nations, make them a confederacy, and expect that it is going to work. And Antichrist will eventually overthrow. Kings from the east will come against him. It's all going to blow up in his face, but there will be an attempt at peace, which is not going to work. Here is the flag for uh, the European Union, 12 stars. They don't really give a reason for the 12, but uh, just kind of in circular form showing the uniting of nations together. Again, just want to reiterate, we have outside the European Union headquarters in Brussels, we have the woman riding the bull or the beast, which is a reference, as we saw in Revelation, to the coming Antichrist system, the false apostate church, the prostitute, the woman, and the beast will get along for some time until the beast or Antichrist says, no, no more of this religion, everyone will worship me. And so ironic that this is outside the European Union building. I pulled a few images. We got the Europol, the European Union Agency for Law Enforcement Cooperation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine when there's one police force, one judicial system over multiple countries and nations, how dangerous that is? Not to mention the Euro, the European Central Bank. Do you see this, my friends? You talk about globalism. You talk about the setup for the coming Antichrist system, the European Union is definitely a foreshadowing of that. Here's the, here's the thing I want to end with today and kind of keep you on the edge of your seat for November 3rd. This is an actual photograph of a meeting of the European Parliament. And I think we're going to get a zoom in on that. What I want you to see is the people of all these different nations. I want you to look at all the headphones. And you see that all, all these people with all their different earpieces and headphones on. Do you know why that is? Because in the European Union, you have all different languages. You have people from all over the world trying to come together and meet and get something done. But they can't understand each other because of the language barrier. Does this sound familiar? The last time, okay, there was the flood, then there was the Tower of Babel. The last time humanity tried to come together against God and communicate as one to do their own thing, God intervened and dispersed the people and confused the languages. What we have today, my friends, is a globalistic system, and more and more people are buying into it. We're coming into the phase of a one world government where everybody wants to come together and they're trying to get over the language barrier so that we can all come together and do the thing that we want to do. My friends, God is not in that. God wants language barriers taken down for the point of the transmission of the gospel and of honest friendship but not for the purpose of a global one world government, which is clearly going to be the system of the anti-Christ. And I don't have time to go further with this, but I want to give you a teaser for the next time we meet. I am going to take the Tower of Babel, this European Union image or scene of globalism today, and I'm going to pull it together and show you what the Tower of Babel and the Day of Pentecost have by way of total contrast. And the Day of Pentecost is the day that God poured out the power of his Holy Spirit on human beings. And I want you to see the incredible thing that happened with the language barrier on that day. As we ponder the wrong that we try to do in uniting ourselves against God, we are going to see the blessing that comes when we wait together on God for our hearts to be united by the power of his Holy Spirit for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen out there? Okay, I'm going to go through this, bring it to the end. I, I got 
far ahead of myself in my studies. I have a lot more to share with you. I'm going to take it to my last slide because this is so important. And I want you to remember something as the technical department reminded me. If you've got in mind your, your matching grant, um, and you're thinking about that matching grant, I want to tell you that when you send a donation or give online, please tell us, and we'll be releasing the details soon, so don't send it yet, but please tell us that that is a special offering towards the matching grant. But even if you're not doing it for the matching grant, if God has laid it on your heart to give, hopeandpassion.org online, Hope and Passion Ministries in Irwin, Pennsylvania, you know we are teaching you the truth of God's holy, unfailing word. And I am doing by the power of God's spirit my level best to relate this word to the current times in which we live. That you might live for Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind. And that you might always interpret everything in the world that is happening through the lens of the unchanging word of God who is timeless and knows beginning from end. Hallelujah. I hope this has been a study that has opened up your eyes. I pray that your appetite has been whetted for more things to come. You guys are wonderful. Thanks for bearing with me and studying so deeply. I, I just think that times like these are precious because, uh, you know, there's a time for taking the gospel and making it very simple, and there's a time for believers to dig in. Amen? And this is our time, and we're very grateful for that. Don't forget Sunday morning. 10 a.m. when despair meets Jesus. That will be a very simple and powerful presentation of the gospel in terms of when either unbelievers or believers come to Christ and say, I'm desperate. I need help. I, I know you'll be blessed by that. Remember, we do not meet for Bible study next Tuesday because it's the fourth Tuesday. We will meet on election night. So go vote before 6.30 and then get in the word with me so we can have our mind in the right place as we begin to see the results of the election unravel. Speaking of that, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for our nation right now before we go. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your sovereignty. I pray for each and every soul that has been listening and that will listen. I pray in the name of Jesus that they will hear what you have wanted them to hear and apply what you've wanted us to apply. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, make us live the gospel loud and large for you, Lord God. We have hope in you, hope for that government of Jesus and his peace that will have no end. God, we hope in your gospel. And now I pray for the United States of America. And the upcoming election, I pray that God's people will vote. I pray that your sovereign will be done in Jesus' name. Be with us again until we, be with us, Lord, until we meet again. I pray your greatest blessing, your deepest conviction, and your most wonderful comfort over each and every person. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.